Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor, and I just want a quilt. So today we're talking to Barbara Brackman. She is um, a quilt historian. She is the one who gathered all of the different quilt blocks and put it into an encyclopedia. It is what gives us the core of what we have today for many people. Um, she, did that, she did that in the 70s. Um, we're talking to her about that. She also did applications at Quilt Historian. She's super cool. Um, I'm super thrilled to chat with her. So, um, the way these start out, so what I want to chat with you about, and you may have ideas as well, is I'd love to chat with you about, um, first, the encyclopedia and sort of all that. Um, Also, your quilting life and sort of what you see that the place of history is in current quilting environment. Um, Those are kind of the big things. Is there anything else that you'd like to, sort of big themes that are interesting and important to chat about? No, Um, not really. Not really. Yeah, Okay. Um, and then we start out with, the first thing we start out with is the same question for everyone. And then I had one more thing I wanted to say. I can't remember. Oh, I don't remember. So we'll figure it all out. Um, uh, so if there's anything you want to chat about that's off the record, which now I understand what that means, um, off the recording, um, we can totally do that. And if for some reason we get onto a subject that you really want to talk about but you don't want public, um, you just let me know either at the time or after or even after, uh, out, you know, a couple days from now. And I'll just edit it out. Um, And there's no hard-hitting – it's not hard-hitting journalism. (laughs) It's like low-hitting, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, we just chat for like a – I don't know, about 30 minutes at most. So uh, we can chat longer if you want, but that's about 30 minutes. Does that sound okay? All right. Okay, cool. All right, so we're going to first say tell me who you are and where you are. My name is Barbara Brackman, and I live in Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah, we were just talking about the, the weather. Everyone's complaining about how cold it is, but I don't think we're mm-hmm. not. Our houses just aren't built for the cold, I have to say. So we have, it's just pathetic. There is not. Yours isn't, isn't either. It's old. It's old. It's old. Ours is old, too. Ours is like a 100-year house with my, my dad lives with us, and he's just like, there's no insulation at all. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, my least has insulation, but I tell you, it's got big picture windows that were Put in when gas was three dollars a month here. <laughs> That's nice. Yes, well, it's such a mess. We're such a mess. We're such babies about the cold. But and my sister lives up in mm-hmm. Boise, and like, she's just like, "Well, you were pathetic." <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, I'm super, super, super excited to talk with you. Um, you're super important to the the quilting world. Um, I think your work is profoundly important um and i'll tell you why and then we'll we'll, we'll ask the first question the encyclopedia work that you did sort of the putting together of what the traditions are and where they came from is sort of the anchor the the sort of the grounding on which um we can look at quilting we can study quilting um sort of your devotion to it and what you did um is I, I just think it's super important, and, and it's not just as super important to quilting, but for this project, it's super important because it really shows the common building blocks, the common language of any art thing, and it's done in such a specific way and such a, you know, you can, like, actually see it. Um, so I'm really, I'm super thrilled to talk to you, and it means a lot. You're, like, you're mm-hmm. it for me, so... Um, so before we begin, so on that note, on that intro note, <laughs> my fangirling over you, um, uh, the first question we always ask is, uh, what's your first memory of sewing or quilting in your life? In the house, like when you're a kid? Well, or... I'm thinking, I'm thinking I, I, I always liked to sew as a child. When I was a kid, you could buy this towel with the outlines, and I loved to embroider. I came from a family that my mom... Modern mother just thought that was the moment because <laughs> you could buy dish towels. But I love doing it. So my earliest memory is like sewing my school uniform to a dish towel. That's really cool. Just for, you know, sewing through all the way. Mm-hmm. And do, 
Um, when did you get interested in quilting? When I was <laughs> when I was in college, I happened to take an art history class in an art museum that had storage in it, and it was full of the drawers and storage were full of quilt cloth. It was just a coincidence. I mean, it's the only art museum I know of that has drawers full of quilt cloth, but they were Carrie Hall's quilt cloth. That's really And it really was far odd. more interesting to me than, I don't know what we were talking about, Renaissance art. And so I kept looking at these through these drawers and getting in trouble in class. So then I asked if I could come in after class, you know, when no one was using the room, which was only 10 minutes every hour, and look through the drawers, which I did. So that's how I got interested in quilts. I just... I think I have a natural affinity for pattern. That's um, really I have a, my degree is in behavioral psychology. So I always think in terms of what my what my skill areas are, and I have this incredible visual memory, which is very fortunate. And I it focuses on patterns. So I opened those drawers and I thought, well, I think I'll make one of these. How hard could it be? That's really interesting. And then, how did you get interested in the, doing the encyclopedia? How did that come to you? Well, that I was I have a degree in behavioral psychology and a very hard job. I, I taught a class at the university, a demonstration class for special ed, and it was just twelve hours a day work and I was young and so I had time for hobbies at night. And I made the quilts, but then I realized I was more interested in sorting the patterns. You know, you think, Well, what am I gonna do next? I think I'll you know, think of the pattern here, if I find a pattern in a book and then I started drawing the patterns. And then pretty soon I was indexing the patterns on index cards. And that was my relaxation in the evening. It was something I could control. Which That's I, really you know, cool. The class was That's so cool. Out, out of control. So it was just a relaxation, and it still is. A, every day I try to index something because it, it just really, it's like, it's sort of, you know, like retail therapy. Sometimes shopping just relaxes you so much by looking at all the possibilities. It's the same thing. It's yeah. So how do you feel about things like Pinterest? Pinterest seems well, to know, sort of I wish I, under, yeah. wish I, I could manage the Pinterest thing a little better. Um, I think it's great. I mean, anything that puts visual images up there and will keep them up there, you know, they won't, but yeah. it's great. I, I use it a lot. I have several different Pinterest boards trying to share Things like if you're interested in turkey red, you can look at examples of my turkey red Pinterest board. Yeah. Or if you want to look at what a quilt might look like that was made in 1856, I have a Pinterest board just for that year. So Amazing. it's that's where I'm indexing things a lot now. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you're, when you started to index it, were you, you were, tell me, take me through, help me imagine what you were doing when you first, when did you first start indexing the different quilt? patterns and what they are the different blocks that people that sort of the building yes, blocks the block. of quilting right so yes. and so yeah you know Carrie Hall does blocks that I found at the back of the art history room she had done it mm -hmm. but I didn't like her system she did it by name and of course if you don't know the name you can't find it my father was a computer programmer mm -hmm. and so I grew up with that kind of talk at the table and so I thought well you could index them better or more easy to find if you would put all the nine patches that had a grid of nine yeah. patch in them in one area, and then all the four patches, and then all the stars in another. Yeah. And Carrie Hall had sort of started this, but she, she just got digressed by the names, which mm -hmm. are so variable. Yeah. So my father was a computer programmer, and I had taken some training, and I thought, you know, someday you might be able to, like, scan, the word wasn't there yet, in a block and it would tell you what the name was. So I was thinking like that and I'm still thinking like that and I probably could do that now but it's a lot of programming. I mean yeah. I wouldn't do it. I would get my boyfriend to do it. But, and he <laughs> could do it but it's a lot of programming. It's a lot we of don't programming. Wanna, you so know have, where we got. Yeah have you seen anyone has anyone taken the work that you've done or others and put it into a searchable database? Well, you have the quilt index. Yeah. Every quilt index picture, if the if the documenters knew of it, put a Blackman number in it. And there's, unfortunately, those Blackman numbers. That's not my favorite name. But um, so if you look up a number yep. in the quilt index, 
Yeah. It doesn't always work because the quilt index is so full of numbers, you know. Yeah. So you might put in number 238, then you get the, the 238th quilt they saw in Utah that day. But you can still use Braxton numbers in the quilt index, and that's, I do that every day. If I'm looking at a pattern and I will look in the quilt index you to see how many index. examples they have. Of right. It. So I'm at the quilt index now, and I just put in a number for so, one of them. And it's, it's, you know, put it, I mean, it's, it's not easy to use because yeah. They're, yeah. they're still continuing to add data. And there's someday when we're going to then go back and see how we can, we can search it. Yeah. But I wish that there was a there was a file for good fragment number, but nobody ever programmed it that way. I'm probably the only person who cares. Yeah. Um, you could see up in the top right corner, you could put a number in there. And I usually put a space before the number and a space after. And sometimes that helps to find well, it. Let me try it. So just in the top, I mean, I, I, at the search quilt records, hmm? when it, at the very top, it has a search bar and it says search quilt records, and you just put yeah, the number? Yeah, just a general. I can go to that. I'm yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm there. I'm doing it. Remember. Interesting. So they, I mean, they've done the best job. Yeah. Of index. They're, okay. There you go. So I have so my much. encyclopedia. I can go to number that. That was popular. Yeah. Interesting. How about, let's see. Yeah, to find a nice number. 3735. Let's see what happens if I put 3735 with a space before it. Now that is just a regular old, what we might call a LeMoyne star. And then I put, put go, and then it, you know, it's slow. It's got thousands slow. and thousands. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, thinking, it's doing its little whirling thing. Yeah, it's whirling on my side, too. Well, yeah. it's we'll interesting. Probably, see, we're probably going to break it because we're both doing the same thing. Okay. okay, so here's what comes up. The second thing is just the exact same star that it's in there. Yeah. If you get that, it's, it says eight-pointed star Yeah, that's what I got. Well, yep. Basic so, information. That works. And then I go, and there it goes. There's your Brackman number. How cool are you? You have my system. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. so cool. Yeah, you know when you, it's your own name and you never liked it in the first place. <laughs> you go, oh my <laughs> now God, it's I everywhere. Change <laughs> my name to something beautiful. <laughs> That's really great. So there it is. I mean, you can find. I don't. I'll just go back and see how many they found. Um, too many to look at. Yeah, sure. but that's so cool. And so that so they. They've got 536 of them, where people put in that particular number for a star. That's really amazing. That's amazing. So, yeah. don't you think? I mean, I think it's Well, that was my intent. That yes. was when I started, I thought, yeah, I many of my best friends don't live anywhere near me, and all we do is talk about quilt patterns all day. Uh -huh. So if I want to talk to my friend Mary Kay Wobble, I can say, you know, it's 3735, and she knows what I'm talking That's about. So cool. Without a, and we used to do it on the phone, so now we can I send images. But, That's so cool. Um, I it, love it. it was so you could communicate. That's really cool. Now I'm dying. Now, see, I'm starting to go, oh, my, look at all those stars. Yeah. I'm going to fly off so I don't get that. Yeah, I love it. I just love it. Um, so take me back again to how you created the encyclopedia. So you, where did you... You organized it I just by the, the had these index cards. Yeah. And then Mary Kay, in fact, Mary Kay and Beth Ramsey, they invited me one time to Tennessee. They were they have wonderful quilts in Tennessee to look at old quilts. And I brought my little box of index cards so we could we could identify the patterns. Mm -hmm. It was probably five hundred index cards. And they said, you know, people could use this if it were in a book and that floored me. But I just decided I would Make an index that Mary Kay and Beth could use. I'm thinking of my, you know, my friends at the various quilt projects. Right. And this was probably about 1979, maybe. And I, uh, then, no one would publish this. Of course, it was ridiculously obtuse. So fortunately, I had a good typewriter and um, a Kinko, not a Kinko store, a Xerox store near me. Uh huh. And they started Xeroxing these and put, punching holes in them and selling them. And um, people encouraged it. And then at one point, the American Quilter Society in Paducah said, 
we would take the whole thing and make a book out of it, which they did. So which is a bound book, sort of like a year book, you know, the inexpensive binding. Yeah. And then later, Penny McMorris at the Electric Club said, you know, we could make a database out of this. <laughs> of course, I forget about that. That's the most obvious way it's been used is to make block base. Yeah. Which has all 4,000 piece patterns in there. That's amazing. I mean, it is. And Penny, I think Penny, I'm just thinking, because I always go, when I'm looking at the Penny, you drew that wrong. I always think of Penny as drawing these, and I, I, I think she did. She said, months drawing all the blocks in in some kind of a computer CAD, you know. Uh-huh. And that, so you can look up any block by name, by number, by who designed it, by year it was made, and then it will draw it out any size as templates or... But, you, you know, I didn't do that programming. Yeah, that's just amazing, though. Penny did. Penny and, so- and Dean did an A.N. probably. So in the in the um, the back of the book is the references. How did you find the blocks and how did you identify the numbers? How do, I mean, not the numbers, the year, because it has the 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 year that from the publication, right? If you had, if there well, is a publication. Well, first of all, I'm you know a big reader, and I always wanted to be a librarian, but but it, I never had the time to go to library school. So I loved the Dewey Decimal System. I thought that was just ingenious. Mm-hmm. And so I, I based it on a Dewey Decimal System where there's decimals and a number, and then the number on the first side of the decimal is the general category, and then you have variations after the decimal. Right. Now, I probably should have taken a librarian class in Dewey Decimal. I would have been a lot better. It would have been a better system if I'd really been able to get a big picture. So that's where the numbers come from. Now, I forgot having that. Having a degree in behavioral psychology, I worked for many years for the state of Kansas in special ed and doing various jobs. But one of them for several years was I went around to schools all over the state helping kindergarten teachers who had children, young children who were showing early signs of problems. And so I was their advisor. They, I'd look at this kid. I'd give him a few tests. I'd say, I think this is what we need to be doing with this kid. And it was great that the state would pay for that. I mean, the mm-hmm. teachers, it was so advantageous for the teachers and certainly for the kids. Now, of course, that's all long gone. So when I was, I was laid off of that job. But when I did do that job, I would find myself in small towns for two days with nothing to do. So I just, I just went to the library to see what they had. That's really and cool. um, and then I'd also look at the microscope. So sometimes they would have a run of a periodical agricultural magazine, and I pretty quickly figured out how to find quilt patterns in an agricultural magazine. And then I read a lot of microfilms in those little libraries. So, and then they didn't hadn't even invented the Xerox machine back then, or I couldn't afford it at a dime a piece. So I drew each one on these little index cards that I dragged around. That's really cool. So that's where I found them, and uh, and I went. Anytime I traveled, I would go to a library and see what they had. And then you. And then I correspond with my friends, Joyce Gross and Cuesta Benberry and Mary Kay Wavell and Willene Smith and I. I mean, we're fascinated by the same thing, so we would trade. You know, Mary Kay would say, "Here, I've I've found this in a Tennessee newspaper," and uh, Joyce Gross would just had tons of references that that I copied. It's really cool. Now, did you get to a point, you know, when you do research, you get to a point where you start to see things over and over again. Did you get to a point where you felt like you had kind of the bulk of the different types of uh, piece patterns? Or is there just so many that you can never end? I felt like I had I had probably seen every periodical I was going to see in my limited experience. Now, one thing Willene did, Willene used to buy them because you, they were cheap on, not on, they were cheap in, uh, you know, you could buy cold runs for two years, say, at Prairie Farmer. And Willene would buy them. And so that's, you know, she has a great collection. But I felt like I, in all the libraries I'd seen, I probably had seen all the agricultural magazines, all the Kerry Hall books, all the Ruth Finley books. I was going to see. So it was now 
there's just nothing new coming up. Yeah. It's not that there weren't new patterns or new quilts. I didn't have access to quilts. I had access to books yeah. and magazines. And did you did you focus just on books and magazines? Like if you found an old quilt somewhere, did you include that material or just published material of patterns? No, it says published patterns. It has yeah. to be published. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, Pete, now, then, years later, I thought, well, I could do the same for applique. Yes. And an applique, because applique is so much more variable. Uh I would put in there, I saw this in a quilt dated 1856, or a quilt that was in the the Florida Quilt Project or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So incredible. It's really incredible. You know, and it's just, it's just the way I think, which is, I just like to categorize things. My spices are nicely alphabetized, you know. Yeah. Everything is on, in a nice order. Yeah. And so I, it's just something I enjoyed doing. And as I say, it was relaxing. Now, if there was a point when the bottoms fell out of the special ed business I was in. And all the grants were gone and, you know, no one was doing anything extra. So all my, I was a reading teacher. All those jobs just disappeared. So I thought, well, I better go back to school and get, fitted for another job and then I thought wait a minute I bet I can make a living at this not a great living but I live in a little town Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't take a whole bunch to live in a little town so I just quit looking for a job and I decided I would do this as a living that's really cool how do you so I would imagine sales of your books are part of it right sort of the economic side they were they They were were. they Um, were how did how do you books, books yeah so tell me. Dead. Books are dead. Yeah. So how do you make a living? Mm-hmm. Like what kind of what kind of revenue streams are available um, if you want to do what you're doing? Like how do you make a living? I have to tell you, the government pays me a nice salary every month, which they call Social Security. Uh-huh. I just to think of it as they're paying me to research whatever I want to. It's <laughs> that, Federal grant. So, I mean, I don't have to work anymore. Right. And it's a good thing, you know. And then I fell into other things. I worked for magazines for years. Mm -hmm. I was an editor, contributing editor, Quilter's Newsletter for 20 years. And then I started designing fabric for Moda, which was a great, great entertainment and also a great boon because there's money to be made in fabric. But that has really changed because no one's very interested in traditional fabric right now. Yeah. So, so I'm not doing that. And I'm, I'm happy to be retired because I've been doing it for 20 years and I was kind of out of ideas. <laughs> Let me ask you about the modern quilters. Where do they, where do they fit mm-hmm. within the traditional, how do, how do you, what, what, when you see a modern quilt, what do you see? And do you feel like there's new stuff getting created? Like, do we need a, do we need a new volume of your work or are they borrowing oh, from the God. past? I'm not going to index them. No. <laughs> You're not going to do I it. I stopped indexing in 1971, I think. I said, wait a minute. And that's when I was working for Quilter's Newsletter. I had so much, well, pretty quickly, had so much access to new stuff. It uh-huh. was overwhelming. Yeah. So anything after 1971, you can call it whatever you want. That's really interesting. As far as the modern quilters, I have a lot of art history background. And so I know a lot about modernism and modern design going back to 1910 in Europe. So when I see a modern quilt, I often look at it by analyzing what the principles of design are. Some, you know, is someone using negative space? Is someone um, altering the scale? You know, is, does it follow the basic three shapes you're allowed to use if you're strictly modern? Squares, triangles, and circles. So my my, my view of modernism is definitely based on art history. Interesting. And people... You know, they are following those principles that are 100 years old, mm-hmm. so, whether they know it or not. Yeah. So do you think – I'm going to ask some copyright stuff. So do you think that the blocks that you found, anyone should be able to use those blocks? That there are a whole bunch of blocks that everybody uses and shapes and that that's kind of the common pool for quilters to use? Well, that's a good thing about in block, in block base or in EQ. Not in EQ, but in my encyclopedia of piece patterns and applique too, is that they're before 1970. Now, copyright, I just tend to, cons- I'm not a lawyer, but I've talked to lawyers about it. I, to be safe, I say 90 years. If the block was published 
in 1910, mm-hmm. it's certainly out of copyright. Yes. But there's also other, there's other things about copyright. Mm-hmm. For one thing, you have to maintain your copyright. That's right. For and certain, places, that's right. Yeah. you know, places that have went out of business during the Great Depression did not maintain their copyright. Yeah. So most of these ladies' magazines, I mean, there's no one who ever cared. They never thought it would have a viable a market. So much of that stuff is still technically in copyright, except no one ever enforced it, and then you lose your rights. The other thing is that what I did in that encyclopedia, I talked to lawyers about it definitely at the time, there's a paragraph called fair use, uh-huh. which means you can index something right. if it's for the greater good or for knowledge, uh-huh. which is why I feel I can put on my blog, I always put a link, but I do copy a picture from a museum or from the quilt index because I feel that's a fair use. I'm not selling the picture, but I'm saying, here's one of 17 quilts exactly the same. What can we learn about this pattern? So that's fair use. That is totally fair use. So there's use. some right. subtlety. That's right. But, you know, people have learned. Don't mess with – people learn very quickly not to mess with Jeffrey Gutchin because they would use his – his copyright patterns, and he would sue him. That's really interesting. So you really, you know, if you're going to copy something from the past, make sure it really is from the past. Yeah, that's really interesting. And the same with the fabric. You know, what? all I did when I designed fabric for 20 years was copy, but I knew what to copy. I mean, William Morris, people say, oh, my gosh, I love your Morris fabric. I didn't do anything except for know where to look. Yeah. I mean, it, that is so out of copyright. It's in the public domain. Right, because you were taking fabric that was old fabric and reproducing it. Was that what you were doing? Yes. Yeah, right. And that's brilliant, and just, right? I, what I had to do was most of the time I could find a couple of images and combine them. A lot of times you can't get the whole repeat uh-huh. in a, an image that say a museum has. So I would try and combine them, find the repeat, and then recolor it in slightly Slightly more contemporary ideas, mm-hmm. and occasionally I would redraw them completely. But I had, I had a pretty good image to start with. That's really interesting. Um, but William Morris is a great designer, um, but his, his work is all in the public domain. That's really interesting. So, what role do you think? You, what role do you see um, quilt history playing in our current? kind of hyper-capitalist quilting world? Like, what role does the histor- historical yeah. aspects play, play? You know, I just commented today on somebody's blog. I said, your dichotomy, this is art historian talking, your dichotomy between commercial art and folk art is false. Mm-hmm. There is no, there is no, there is no right. line. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I remember that. When I was in grad school, they still were starting to sort of differentiate between what they called low art and high art. And high art. <laughs> I was like, really? There, you, Come know. On. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's just... I, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a blog. I'm thinking about it to entertain myself, is to start a blog just on that topic that no one will ever read. You know, but it helps me sort through my thinking. Yeah. No, I'll read it. I, I'm pretty, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't know. So what about people who want to claim copyright? They they, they choose a couple of block, blocks that are really traditional, and then they get upset because somebody has stolen their pattern when they've used traditional blocks. How creative do you think it has to be to actually... Well, see, that's a, that's a lawyer's yeah. question or yeah. a jury's question. Yeah, it is. Because it, what if I take, and I do this all the time, what if I take 12 public domain blocks that were in existence, existed in the Civil War, and I make a sampler out of it, and I design a set, and I pay people to make the quilt for me. I own the copyright on that particular set, and I would, because I know that if you don't, I would enforce my copyright. Mm-hmm. I would write you a letter and say, I designed that. Here's yeah. my proof, cease and desist. Yeah. So it's they can copyright it. It's it's the color, it's the fabric that they use. I've had people sue over someone photographing a public domain pattern done in someone else's fabric, and the person who made the quilt still has the right to sue because she combined the fabric that she didn't make and the common pattern. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. You know, and that's her image. She was smart enough to use those colors. That's right. That's right. That's very true. Right. It's and selection. certainly. Right. It's the, uh, the selection, arrangement, and coordination of that mm-hmm. material, the public domain material and the fabrics yeah. that create the copyright. I mean, I'm gonna plenty, I've seen plenty of ugly public domain quilts, and nobody's ever going to copy them. But when you see one that makes you go, oh, that's pretty clever, mm-hmm. it's probably copyright. <laughs> that's true. I like that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. When you let me ask you another question about the publications. Do you think the publications that you were seeing, the you know from 1971 and before, that they were replicating things? Like my question is, when they were creating that that publication of that quilt, do you think that quilt had been around for a while? That that sometimes it was new stuff in the magazines, but also was it really capturing, say, earlier quilts? styles as well sort of how do you feel about like well what role does that pub that well, that's a good question yeah that's a good question and i you know i really don't know but that, that's one thing i that line between folk art and commercial art that's what i want to explore yeah. and i'm going back to the people who are designing quilts i just spent the morning on a woman who designed quilts in seven, eighteen fifty nine 1859 in england not very many of them where did she get those was that can i find something earlier than her or did she invent the pattern there's a woman, um, 1900, in Massachusetts, who I think invented a lot of patterns. Um, people just assume it was a folk art that had been around. That's and she doesn't write much about it. But if you look at her patterns, you can't find them earlier than her publication. That's really interesting. Okay. Her name was Clara Stone. She deserves I think her name was Clara yeah. Stone. That might have been her pen name. But I'm very interested in that right now. Um, where what is older? What is an invention? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it it just varies from person to person. Depends uh, on what their attitude is. I know a lot of those newspaper columns in the '30s went to fairs and saw what people were making, and then copied them. Some people just made them up out of whole cloth. That's really interesting. So, I mean, if you're looking at women's work, in fact, I want to look at women's work and how women have been making money off this for hundreds of years. That's really interesting. It's all, see, that's a folk art thing. Yeah. It's it's one woman at home taking care of her family. In reality, it's one woman selling patterns and feeding her family because there's no one else around to do it. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, so that you get out of this kind of nostalgic, like it was just my grandmother sewing yeah. a quilt for the bed, um, as opposed to uh, work that was an economic uh, subsidy for the family. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And, it, you know, because it's women's work, women were not supposed to work, so it's never mentioned. Oh, um, it just isn't discussed. Yeah. And I just, and I've been writing about it and, and doing rants. I start with rants that nobody else gets to read, but. <laughs> I like that. These women, like Nancy Cabot, say, or Ruby McKim, are some of the the pattern designers from the 30s who would write little stories. Ruth Finley wrote a story about a bear paw that a man was trying to get to his sweetheart, and he was treated by a bear for two days or something, and he was late for the wedding, or I don't know. And that's where the bear paw pattern came from. Well, that's just, of course, a pile. And um, the irony is that Finley made a good deal of money telling those stories, those folky stories. <laughs> so it's like completely against the way they're living their own lives, but they have to deny it. Right. It's good marketing. Yes. It's yeah. marketing and it's admitting that you don't have a husband who can support you in the style your mother would have liked you to have been. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. That's really interesting. And that's always embarrassing to those people. Yeah. Now today, you know, we go, well, I'm independent, but yeah. that wasn't in their vocabulary. Yeah. That's really interesting. That's and, you know, I just was reading about this woman who did this book in 1859 in London, I think. So I read her biography. Someone has written on this topic about needlework and supporting women. And she had been married three times. She had one illegitimate child. And, you know, in 1850... In London, that one, that was not a thing to do. So she had to support that kid, and she moved to New York to get away from the scandal. But 
here she's talking about needlework and you know its role in the woman's life, the women's sphere, hard mm-hmm. to say. Right. Super interesting. Um. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Uh, Civil War quilts, your um, fascination on it. Tell me more about why the why the interest in Civil War quilts. Well, you know, I live in a I live in a town that was very important in the Civil War, and so I'm surrounded by it all the time. You know, in my old house, there was a plaque out to the side that said, "At this spot, 21 soldiers were killed on August 22nd, 1863." So it's it was always around me when I was a young adult, and so I learned and I worked for the State Historical Society as a researcher in Kansas and the Civil War is very important. So I just learned a lot about the Civil War and then so it's I'm interested in women's history more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I could just as easily be talking about other wars but this one really resonates and and uh, you know you have to focus on something I had a friend one time who said why don't you focus on the war of Jenkins ear? which I think was sarcastic. But. Interesting. Um, and so what, what did you find? I mean, you've written a lot of books on it. You've got quilts from Civil War, right, and Civil War women. So if people are interested in mm-hmm. it, they can get your books at, I'm sure, at Amazon, and we'll put a link to them. Yeah. Um, so what do you take away? Like, if you're not a historian, you're just a – I'm actually trained as a historian. But if you're not a historian oh. and you're just like, well, why should I care about Civil War quilts? I'm just quilting. I'm just quilting. I'm a quilter. Um, why Why should they look at Civil War quilts? Like, what's the plug for Civil War quilts? There are several reasons. One is women's history, which, mm-hmm. you know, hasn't been told very well over the yeah. years. The other is I, I find this, and I remember – I just got interested in history young, and you probably did too, mm-hmm. and so many other people are not. But what I found was that as people start making quilts, they make lists of patterns they're going to make, and they buy every piece of fabric they can find, and they make a bunch of quilts. But as they get more into it and more sophisticated, they get bored with what is the trend today, mm-hmm. and they start looking at the past because trends like fashion and clothing – recycle and regenerate and come out new with new ideas and so people tend as they get more sophisticated to be interested in other ideas than what's the trend today pink and blue you know lots of white baby baby uh, fabrics I mean that's the knee-jerk thing right now yeah so why should they be interested they don't have to I don't care if they do or not but for the people who do get interested you know, it's nice to have accurate history. And I just saw something today on a page that I'm a member of where someone's advertising a log cabin saying it was made in 1850 or 60 by a woman in a wagon train going west. Well, you cannot make a quilt while you're walking. <laughs> and the log cabins are from 18, this one, it looked like it was 1870 or 80. But that's the inaccurate history. Yeah. And it's trying to tell us that women, the poor things are out there in the wagon train, bumping, 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 but still sewing. Well, nobody was allowed to ride inside the wagon unless you were near death. <laughs> and you can't sew inside a situation like that. But people, you know, they have an interest in this kind of American myth of the independent person, yeah. the Westerner. And I've just been reading that new Laura Ingle Wilder book, Prairie Fire. Yeah. Have you seen any mention of that? No, how is, how it's, is it? A woman has... Hmm? How is it? I didn't hear that. How is oh, how's the book? It makes me realize how I was terrified by those little house books. I'm from New York City. Uh-huh. We moved to the West. I did not care for it, as my aunt would say. I did not care for it. <laughs> and uh, the idea of living on a prairie with nothing around you, which yeah. Laura Ingle Wilder... Ingalls Wilder found really fascinating and life-giving just terrified me it was the openness and the emptiness so yeah. I just this I'm having flashbacks now to being a kid and going oh that never happens to us <laughs> that we would have nothing on the horizon <laughs> no sack that they have and how did those people live <laughs> that's very funny <laughs> So that's, I'm finding it interesting. I mean, I think she's doing a great job of the myth. Of, uh-huh. And I'm only up through Laura. Not, Laura's not even married yet. But uh, she starts with the biography, I know, of Laura. So I'm just reading that and going, horrifying, horrifying. <laughs> I like that. 
Hyatt Stewart. I never watched one Little House TV show. You didn't? I, I grew up on The man, <laughs> that father scared me. That's he so was funny. crazy. He was unreliable. That's very funny. That's very funny. Um, my husband is obsessed with Little House shows. <laughs> Because it's, which well, is very odd. Which obviously he's bought into the myth. Yeah, he likes all the economic side of it. He does cultural economics, so he likes the depiction of well, a particular good. time period. So yeah, but it does always make me and giggle because you know they're always on. So, <laughs> so. Oh, right, they are always on. This author spends a lot of time on the economics of Pa, and Pa was just. He made so many bad decisions. It's unbelievable. Really interesting. You know, he was of the buy high, sell low kind of real estate school. Well, we'll have to um, we'll have so to read it, read it, read yeah. it, and have him read it too. Yeah, I totally will. I'll probably I'll... sit there tearing his hair out. Yeah, I know. I think it'll be great. I'll, um, all right, a couple of other questions. Museums. What role do you think museums play within the quilting culture? What's um, what role do they play, in, and how important are they in terms of our world? Well, I, you know, I've worked for museums many times, and museums' job is to keep it, not to show it, but to keep it. And, you know, people all the time say, I would give my quilt to that museum, but they won't show it all the time. Well, lady, if they show it all the time, it'll last about 10 years. Yeah. Their job is to put it away and show it every 20 years for a couple of months. So I think museums have an important job because nobody's cutting those quilts up to make Christmas stockings out of them. Uh-huh. You know, they're they're in good, good uh, cult, um, conditions that we're going to keep them going. Yeah, and because they're in a museum, they have a lot of respect. So I, it's, I think people should continue to donate to museums. Yeah. Museums can't afford to buy anymore, but they can. And what uh, about the can sort donate. of the, the study groups? That you, there's all kinds of different study groups around the country, mm-hmm. um, national ones and local ones. How important are they in terms of quilting? Well, any any sharing of information, you know, is great. Yeah. Um. There's so there's so many ways to do it. You know, I try not to belong to too many online because it's just complete time hole. I will spend hours looking at everything on there and then saying, well, you think you're right there. I I think that's older than you think it is. So yeah. they're very important. They And I think they generate a lot of information that, let, that raises everybody's knowledge. Yeah. So do you feel, it's funny, I was going to ask you, so do you feel like, because you have all this knowledge and you can just see it, do you feel like you just get inundated with people asking you those kinds of questions? And then when they oh, no. get it wrong, what do you say? Because I get that with copyright all the time, right? People people think they know oh. the, all copyright and they tell me things or they ask yeah. me questions. And I know. It's I weird, know. right? People think for some reason they're le- that they, they know legal stuff. And, you know, I've, I've had to sue people or write letters, cease and desist letters. It's yeah. even hard to find a lawyer who will do it for you because they, nobody wants to specialize in that piddly work. Yeah. But um, – being wrong, I don't mind being wrong. I'm yeah. wrong all the time. And I have this whole backlog of uh, words published. So it's fun for me to see that I'm wrong because that, um, you know, I can explain what, why I've changed my mind. Yeah. What about uh, But when I people... don't, I'm not a lawyer. And I try not to play one on TV. I mean, yes. I, uh, I'm talking about pattern history. Now, copyright's a different thing. Totally. Now, what about people that, that come up that to you? Has... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, oh so people don't bother me very much. I'm a very hostile, hostile person. As you, you saw in the email, I wrote to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to talk to people. I got stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I understand. I'm just not, <laughs> I'm one of those writers who love solitude. Yes. Although, I, oh, you know, I do like having a stack to the avenue fairly close, but I think funny. they're all gone. But um, <laughs> I, I do not. I do not suffer fools gladly. And if someone wants to chat with me about quilts made in wagons on the way west, I just I lose my patience very quickly. So like my that. friends know not to, my, all my friends like Sarah at the fabric store downtown, she knows not to say, well, let me get Barbara on the phone and she'll answer that question. <laughs> That's she very good. Be, I think you have could to. Be strangled. Right? You'd have to what? because you have to have that that armor because otherwise, like your life is oh, taken to. up with ridiculousness, right? Ugh. I know, and that you know, I'm my boyfriend one time called me up and said, "You know, you're you have a minor fame in a minor field," and I said, 
Well put, well put. <laughs> so, I mean, being famous is tough. You have to, uh, you have, to have two personas. Yeah. The, no. the famous yeah. person and the, and the real person. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I totally get that. That's really interesting. All right, so uh, the last uh, topic I want to talk to you. So we are, uh, I'm not sure how this is happening, but I'm curious about what your thoughts are. So I think a local shop owner here in New Orleans went to a G's Bend uh, they have like um, retreats, G's Bend retreats. And uh-huh. so, um, ooh, ooh. yeah, so then she brought, she got really into it. And now there's this movement to have G's Bend people come here. And there's a play and there's all kinds of other stuff. And oh. I'm curious oh, what yeah. your thoughts are about G's Bend. And then have people come and talk about it. And I don't know, I'm going to, a, the first planning meeting is like in a couple of weeks. So, oh. um so we're supposed to be in the 300th anniversary of New Orleans, and none of us are very much interested in it. We just want to talk about other places. So this is not in New Orleans. It's in Alabama. So um, so we're That's laughing. So. I know. I know. Because I, I was just in Alabama for Thanksgiving, and I yeah. tried to get my family to go up to Houston, yeah. and they all looked at me. We went to see another battleship. The boys <laughs> like to go look at the battleship. So. So it's no G spin for you, Barbara. Yeah. But uh, what do I think about G spin? Yeah. I think they make some pretty spectacular quilts. Yeah. I, uh, you know, but that's all I got to say. I know nothing about them. I get, if they can make money off of this, it's great because it's yeah. one more example of commercialism versus folk art. If you yeah. can sell things yeah. and you can feed your family or that's right. buy yourself some really nice shoes, which is yeah. what I do with my money, that's what it's about. It's it not. It's not about preserving folk art. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I see there, that across. That's a false. Yeah. It's the economics. I, I heard right? a really impressive lecture by Linda Eaton about two years ago in which she talks about folk art. She works, She's a curator, I think, at the Winter Tour. And she, I never can keep those museums straight. But she talked about how folk art and quilts is just a false construct. It never was. It was always commercial. That's really interesting. And I see this with all these sort of small... Um, very small, like the Etsy shops and the other things. Like, it's the same thing, mm-hmm. right? It's economics. There's an economic component to mm-hmm. this. Um, people are quilting because they want to, you know, there's a, a love of quilting and there's a kind of, there's, there's not, not a, it's not all economic. But those out there trying mm-hmm. to, there is a huge component of it that's economic. Oh, well, some people just love to make quilts. And yeah, some people exactly. don't need money because they married the guy their mother told them to, you know, who right. supports them quite nicely. Or they have their, their own independent income or it's their hobby. Yeah, their, exactly. You know, big their time, escape, right. Big time executives and this is fun. Yeah. But for so many people, it is an income. Yeah. Um, and I read about Etsy recently. I have a shop in Etsy. Uh-huh. And it was talking about the ama- amazing statistics. And then it brought up that most of their sellers are women. So interesting, isn't it? I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, it's really remarkable. Well, super interesting. Um, well, it anything is, else? Well, that, come over sometime. Come over sometime, is that what you I, said? I'm tired. You're tired? <laughs> That's it. I'm tired. I talked for 45, 50 minutes. Yeah. Um, but I was good talking to you, and it's nice to talk to a smart person. Oh. <laughs> I'll do that any day. Oh, that's it's so the, great. Well, I, I just love, I'm, as I said, um, I love chatting with you. I might, you know, as we go, I might um, check back in with you. Um, but the academic work is um, really important, and your work is really important to that because it really does establish a public domain. Your, con- your, your vision of what copyright is and how it is is exactly spot on, and um it, I'm trying to get that that message across in a bigger way, so that your work is super important to me, and I'm just yeah. thrilled to chat with you today. Well, I see. I did. I had to too. Um, I do want to say one flaw in the copyright discussion. There are several people who love rules, yeah. and who will tell you that you may not copy an antique quilt. That you have to get the permission of the owner, whether it's an individual or a museum. Just not true. It's, it's not true. You can't copy their photograph of the quilt, but you can certainly copy their quilt, don't you think? Yep. Because the quilt is 150 years old. Uh, You can do whatever you want. And so a lot of the contests really discourage people because they don't know who owns the quilt they like. That's really interesting. And and all the time I get uh, requests from people who want to put a quilt in a show that 
say they've taken the pattern out of my encyclopedia. It's a public domain pattern from 1854. They have to get my permission. Yeah. Well, that's a pain for me to have to write them back, a pain for them to find me. Right. And absolutely unnecessary. Absolutely unnecessary. Yeah, it's kind of amazing how, so, um, pe- how confused people can get on copyright. Um, yeah. and, and I think it's just because it's its own physics, and once you understand it, then it makes sense, but they uh-huh. just don't understand how it works. Um, and, and that, it, it, that it's an economic system, it. right? It's about econoc- economics yeah. more than anything yeah. else. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. And the thing is, you can't make money off of it. Um, you know, when I am in the pattern business, and whenever we write a pattern, it's used to anyway, we'd say, you may make all the quilts you want in this and show them, give them away, but you may not sell the quilt. You can't take my design and then have a little Etsy store and sell my, the quilts there. Yeah. So that's my understanding, too. That's your understanding. But you can give them away. You can put them in shows. You can get all sorts of credit for your color choice. That's interesting. And because you want to be able to control the market for the quilt itself, are you concerned with them copying the pattern and using like making multiple copies of that pattern? Yes, but... There has to be an economically viable reason why I would mess with this. And yeah. since I have no books in print, you know, it's just not part of my economic life right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I would not want somebody to copy my book, but I just have a hard time now going, well, what's in it for me if I start objecting? Yeah. What's the point of hiring a lawyer when there's no income from it? Yeah. And you hire a lawyer when the there's an economic reason to do that. When someone, I did years ago, and this was a long time ago, but I did when someone absolutely copied something and then published it because mm-hmm. she just didn't understand copyright. Yeah. And so I told her to stop and she said, no, it's a, I can continue to do it. So I ta- we used to have two lawyers in our sewing group. So I talked to them and <laughs> they suggested somebody on the West Coast who specialized in copyright and that lawyer I mean, this is piddly, but here, I'll write a cease and desist letter for you at $500. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. That's what you did. And did she stop? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like, a, nothing like a letter, a cease and desist letter to make you stop. Yep. Yep. And I can't even remember what it was that, that they had done that, you know, was uh, the problem. But Yeah. Interesting. But wow. I do remember the, I do remember paying the money and being used. <laughs> you remember paying the money. <laughs> a lot of dough. Yes. It's a lot of dough. <laughs> yes. It's right. It's true. Oh my goodness. Well, this has been a thrill and a delight, and I so appreciate your time today. I really do. It means a lot. Well, I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed it. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna hang up. All right, fabulous. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. So this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people to be interviewed. Suggest yourself to be interviewed. We are excited to hear from you. But most importantly, I hope you get a chance to quilt today.